Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today for Getting Krabby, uh, Careers with Invasive Green Crabs. Um, my name is Leah Althauser, and I am our Environmental Education Coordinator with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I use she, her pronouns. And I would like to um, introduce that just before we begin, a couple of quick housekeeping things. So this program is part of our Wild Washington Environmental Education Program. Uh, you can learn more about Wild Washington. Uh, I'm going to pop a link in the chat really quick. So we have um, we do career connections, we have field trip kits, um, and uh, other exciting outdoor activities. Uh, we have enabled closed captioning, but if you would like to turn it off, please click the button uh, with the two C's in the lower right hand corner of your toolbar and you'll see an option for turning off subtitles. We won't be taking any verbal questions today, so raised hands will not be called on, but if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we will ask uh, Chelsea at the end. Today's event will be recorded for those who are unable to attend. So please check out the WDFW YouTube channel uh, to find past Wild Washington Live recordings. And with that being said, I'm really excited to introduce our presenter today. Chelsea Buffington is the lead biologist on our European Green Crab team. And her work involves getting to know a little bit more about European Green Crabs and figuring out what are we gonna do about this species. So Chelsea, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Um, let's see here, so I'm gonna share my screen. All right. So hello everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. As Leah stated, my name is Chelsea Buffington and I work for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Unit. Um, my primary role is as the department's European Green Crab Management Lead and I'll get into more of what that means and what I do on a day to month to year basis a little later on. But first, I'm gonna talk about myself a little bit because who doesn't love to do that? Uh, I am a Pacific Northwest native. I grew up in Lewis County in a small town called On Alaska. So I spent a lot of time playing outside and enjoying the pristine habitats that we get to call home here. I have family members who are extremely enthusiastic for anything hunting and fishing, and I myself love to get out into the woods to hike, gather up some mushrooms, poke around tidal pools, go paddling with my pups, and soak up all the things we sometimes take for granted in this region. I always had a strong interest in science-related topics, but when growing up, um, or growing up, but that wasn't my initial career path. Uh, I started down the path of business and quickly learned that that actually wasn't for me. Um, so I started my science career path by attending Portland State University uh, with a plan to get a bachelor's in organismal biology. After a year or so, I was fortunate enough to do a study abroad program in Australia at James Cook University. I wound up actually transferring there and I stayed and completed my studies and I received my Bachelor of Science in Marine Biology in 2015. I felt very privileged to be able to attend this university. They are currently ranked as the top marine and freshwater biology institution in the world. Uh, when I was there, I was able to learn from professors that were leaders in their fields. Uh, we did a lot of hands-on field work in a variety of topics from fisheries management, conservation, biodiversity. And I even wound up in the desert studying a tree at one point. Uh, that wasn't exactly my favorite field trip that I went on. Uh, but it definitely stuck with me and I learned a lot from that. Um, definitely have a fear of flies now and uh, sulfur tasting water and everything was so hot that I think I burnt my tongue on an orange. Uh, all in all these experiences overseas were very vital to developing my career path and getting me the knowledge and skills to do things I'm currently doing with the department. When I returned from Australia, I had a little bit of a hard time getting a job, which is okay, it happens. I worked for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a port sampler for one season, and I traveled a little bit after that to see what I could see and learn what I could learn. I served with AmeriCorps mentoring students, and I ultimately wound up back at PSU to get a graduate certificate in GIS. Uh, their program was fantastic. I got to work with professors that really knew their specialties, and I even got the opportunity to work on a project with an assistant professor from Hamilton College on the East Coast and I got a couple maps published in her book. 
Uh, this experience was another step in my career path that has set me on a traje trajectory to where I am today. <clears throat> when I really buckled down to start looking for work in my related field, I started by setting up my profile on the careers.law.gov, which I recommend you all do as well. Um, I found my way into other various groups that would email jobs uh, related to the science field and join different forums to make sure I knew what was coming up. In early 2018, a job posting came my way offering three different positions with the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit at the department. I applied for and was hired as a five month non-permanent scientific technician to working with green crab. However, I learned a thing or two from the persistence of invasive species, and I have managed to continue to grow in that position into where I am currently today, which is a bio three for the department. Before I get into more details about what I do for the unit in green crab, I wanna give you a brief rundown of what our unit is all about. And um, for starters, the WDFW's mission is to preserve, protect, and perpetuate fish, wildlife, and ecosystems while providing sustainable fish and wildlife recreational and commercial opportunities. And in order to protect Washington's environmental, economic and human resources, the WDFW is the state lead for preventing the introduction of new, controlling the spread of existing and eradicating locally established aquatic invasive animal species. Um, our unit, the AIS unit is charged with planning, coordinating and leading the implementation of management actions on state lands and in addition, uh, we collaborate a lot with tribal and federal agencies when requested. Uh, there's a lot of assistance that we provide and consultations. <clears throat> the AIS unit has been relatively small until more recently, and it's a bit more complex than some might realize. We are actually split, in, split into two different categories. We have an AIS prevention team and the ballast water team. And with that said, it's more like three teams. I don't wanna leave out mentioning that we also work alongside WDFW enforcement. They have been leading the charge with our watercraft check stations and have been doing a fantastic job at prevention and eradication, um, education and outreach for aquatic invasive species such as zebra and quagga mussels. If any of you are familiar with our mussel sniffing dog puddles, this is the unit that she actually works for. Uh, the section of the unit I work in is the AIS prevention team. So again, that's a lot of prevention, early detection, rapid responses, management actions, collaboration, et cetera. Currently, our two priority projects are zebra quagga mussels and European green crab. We've recently added a very much needed position to fill in some of those other gaps that we have um, that we're experiencing in terms of decontamination and education and outreach as well. So diving in a little bit into the green crab world, um, this slide shows the staff we had this last season. In the top left corner is myself holding the little green crab, followed by Ron Coleman, who sadly was not able to join us today. He originally started with us last field season as a scientific technician on the outer coast. And partway through this year, he became our newest permanent bio one. We also had four other career seasonal scientific techs, uh, two in the North Sound region, such as Bellingham, Drayton Harbor, and two in the Salish Sea region, region which extends from uh, you know, Macaw, Nia Bay area through Drayton Harbor. Um, we do have some vacancies for next field season. So if you are interested, you're already one step ahead by being here today, but please reach out and keep an eye out for future job announcements. Before we go any further, I think it's probably pretty important to discuss what a green crab actually is and how to identify them. So for starters, green crabs are very small, aggressive, and proficient invaders. Um, <clears throat> in the state of Washington, they are a prohibited level one species, meaning they pose a high invasive risk and are a priority for prevention and expedited rapid response management actions. This allows us to do a lot of the work that we're doing currently. The easiest way to identify a green crab is by counting the little spines or teeth on either side of its eyes on its shell or carapace, right here. Green crabs are the only crab in our area that have five marginal teeth. For example, the little shore crabs you might encounter when turning over a rock on a beach, those little crabs only have three marginal teeth. And larger crabs such as Dungeness, Red Rocks, and Gracefuls have 10. It's also important to note that not all green crabs are green. So using color as an indicator is not recommended. 
We have several native species that tend to be green as well, and they are commonly misidentified. So what does a day in the life look like for a green crab cytech? Well, <laughs> for starters, it can be physically exhausting at times, but it can be very rewarding work. Technicians typically hold a seasonal position that runs from April to October. Uh, this season, we actually extended some of those positions a month to do some emergency removal. Uh, April to October is the more active months for green crab, and that's why we have technicians during that time, and also the weather gets a little bit dangerous in the winter. Uh, technicians spend about 80 to 90 percent of their time in the field, and the rest of that time is usually reserved for data entry or other miscellaneous tasks. Uh, our techs are out there working as our first line of defense against green crabs. They're finding access to new sites that look like they have suitable habitat. They're building connections with local communities. They're out there hiking to remote locations with all sorts of gear on their backs. It can get pretty heavy. They're making decisions on the fly for trap placements based off green crab biology and ecology. They're working up to 10 hours a day in the mud out in the elements. As I said before, it can be very exhausting work, but that work is very important and we wouldn't be where we are today without those efforts. I do want to note, though, that we do take safety very seriously, and when weather just isn't right or the site is too risky or something just isn't feeling comfortable for someone, we will pull it back and readjust. <clears throat> I want to highlight the different types of trapping effort that we conduct. So early detection monitoring is usually undertaken by Washington City Grant, but we do tend to fall into this category occasionally. These, effect, these efforts take place um, before any detections are made and are ongoing thereafter, there are usually fewer traps. Um, they record lots of data and are conducted in a repeated manner. Sea Grant has a wide network for finding green crabs and tracking changes over space and time using this early detection method. And that's one way that you can volunteer and get um, into, those, into this project as well. Prospecting is when we start to get a little bit more uh, planning and labor intensive. These efforts take place where green crab have not been detected yet. There's lots of traps. Um, there's a lot of ground covered and it can at times be very muddy and sticky. Yes, that is me stuck in the mud. Uh, and we have all been stuck at some point or another. So maneuvering through the mud is a very crucial aspect to the job. If you can't do it, it's probably not for you and can be a safety concern for everyone involved. Assessments. So these are very similar to prospecting, except that they take place in areas where green crab have actually been found before. And we're just doing assessments to determine the spatial extent of the population and, and density to see if we need to up the um, efforts there. And removal control efforts is where we set as many traps as humanly possible to remove as many crabs as possible. These efforts, uh, they take a lot of resources, tons of collaboration and consistent pressure. And so now I just want to show a couple clips of what the field work can be like. I'm just going to play. It might be loud. So this is, um, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is an airboat out in Willapaw Bay. Um, without an airboat, we would not have been able to get to these sites where green crab are. And these are uh, <laughs> Areas that are their sensitive areas. Airboats can be a lot of fun, I will admit. And this one here just shows some habitat and you know once we got there where were we setting traps you know we try to set in the water um, at low tide so that we we reduce bycatch and we return the next day so here's some videos of some staff hand capturing some green crabs uh this is ron out at uh, i believe it was john's river in willapaw bay and um, <laughs> they're really fast and they're very mean. So this, this isn't an efficient way of trapping green crab, but when you've already been doing a lot of work out there and you just kind of want to have some fun, this is a lot of fun. And so this video here shows green crab. Uh, I was capturing at Brady's Oysters in Grace Harbor. 
they removed a seed pallet and underneath that seed pallet, I just started picking up green crab that were hiding in the mud. And this video here is of our technician, Lena. And this was her first green crab hand capture. And we sometimes like to get those on video for them because it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know how it got in the rock so fast. I saw it and I was like, you have to go there now. So as I stated before, I started out as a green crab scientific technician myself, and I am now the green crab management lead or lead biologist. I have loved my position working with green crab and being a part of the AIS unit for the past four years. I have had opportunities to cross train and do things that I don't typically get to do. I've gone beach staining. I've gone out with forage fish crews in the middle of the night. I've helped out hatcheries during spawning season. I've given several pre presentations for the unit as well as gone to various expos and conferences. I've been able to get my motorboat operations and certification course. I've been funded through Recreation and Conservation Office to create a GIS based tool for rapid responses, which was able um, and then was able to participate in the 2019 Kettle Falls rapid response tabletop exercise for zebra quagga mussels. I've been given not only the opportunities to continue with green crab work, but have been advocated for by my supervisors to grow within this position and help make it what it is today. Uh, when I first started out, I believe some of the characteristics that helped me get the position, since I actually knew nothing about green crabs, was my ability to adapt, communicate, and peer willingness to get out there. I also researched the unit and green crab fully before the interview. It also didn't hurt that I had my graduate certificate in GIS and had a decent background with marine biology. In 2018, I was the only green crab technician. So I used to spend a lot of time on the road and in the mud and did a lot of work building connections with, with local partners. But now, fortunately and unfortunately, I spend less time in the field. Although I try to get out there from time to time because staff really like to see their supervisors work hard in the mud alongside them. And it can be fun. As I stated earlier, we have grown to six field technicians across the state, a dedicated coastal bio one, and myself a bio three. There's a lot that happens behind the scenes. And now that I have dedicated field technicians, I am able to work on some higher level aspects such as budgets, management plans, partnerships, collaborations, and planning complex field efforts. So this is just a generalized list of what we look for in candidates when conducting hiring and things we expect from all of our staff. The aquatic invasive species management follows an adaptive approach. So we need to be able to be adaptive and flexible ourselves and able to manage our time appropriately and stay organized. We also need to make sure we set time away from work for our own sanities. Mental health is extremely important and we are big advocates for making sure everyone is staying safe and healthy physically and mentally. And with that, I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, our first question is from Chase and he says, walking in the mud is hard. I've assisted with some estuary field work and it's a huge workout and I've gotten just about waist deep. Is there a better way to walk in the mud? This is an ongoing uh, a battle. I think that, you know, we, we use uh, lacrosse hip waders and those boots hug your ankles really well. And um, it's actually kind of a battle with all the shellfish growers to make sure that we all have enough boots in this area to get out there. Um, it's one of those things that you, you just have to learn when you're going through there. And I think that if you can um, stay, you gotta stay quick. You can't sit and wait because you're gonna sink more and you just have to have confidence in yourself to get your foot out and keep going. There's, there are some videos that I believe Sea Grant has done in their presentations where they kind of try to show you how to maneuver your foot back and forth if you are stuck so you get out. If not, having a bucket really helps you just kind of limp along through the mud. Thank you. Our next question is from Laurel. She's an undergrad who recently, who was recently accepted into her university's GIS minor. Can you talk 
a bit about what you've had to do with GIS and how your certificate has helped you in this role. Yeah, so GIS, I mean, you know, spatial analysis, I think is really important. And uh, the more we learn about, I'm going to talk about just invasive species as a whole, but bringing in invasive species and, and using GIS to, you know, take in different factors of climate change or, you know, range expansion. Um, you know, there's a ton, a ton of different ways you can use GIS. So just knowing that you have those tools and being able to use that for, um, it just sets you a little bit above the rest, I feel like, in terms of you have a technology advancement of using GIS because there's it's becoming more common, I think, for people to have backgrounds in GIS. But when I started, I was the first one in my unit to really have true education on it. And it has helped. Um, you know, I don't use it very often anymore, but if we have something that we need with uh, spatial analysis, I understand the concepts and can talk with other experts on what we're looking for. Awesome, thank you. Our next question is from Carol and she wants to know, how do you attract green crabs to your traps? Yeah, so um, this is an ongoing bait, right? Every time you go crabbing, everyone's gonna tell you they have the best best way to get crabs into their traps. And, and it doesn't really stop with recreational crabbers. Uh, we use mackerel, so we like the stinky bait. Um, and mackerel actually stays intact a little bit better than I've seen from other stuff, but people use squid. Um, historically, they've tried cat food. They've done a lot of different things. We use what um, Sea Grant uses uh, to try to standardize a little bit. Um, there are studies with doing pheromones. Uh, that is still expensive, so we haven't really dabbled with that yet. Um, but there's also off-season um, things that we're experimenting with in terms of habitat traps where it's not so much the, the food, the bait source that you're using or the smells, it's do they have a place to hunker down and hide? And so that's some of the stuff we're exploring as well. Thank you. Um, our next question is from April and they would like to know, are you anticipating a bio one position for the Salish Sea region will be open in the coming years? Hi, April. <laughs> <laughs> so April was my was a side tech on our team uh, a couple of years, not this last season, but the season before. And I am not sure yet. We have some funding requests going on, but currently what I stated earlier is where we're at right now with the six uh, technicians, uh, the coastal bio that Ron has filled, and then myself. So there are still positions available, and I would just say keep an eye out because things can might change drastically in the next couple of months. Great, thank you. Our next question, our next question is from Amanda, and they'd like to know for ages 18 to 22, is there any work available? I'm currently working on my marine biology degree. My, my, I can't talk today. My marine biology degree and would love to get it out in the field as soon as possible. Yeah, so I think that there's going to be some volunteer options if that's what you're meaning, not so much like a job. So um, if you I, again, would keep an eye on what's happening with green crab. Um, the Washington Invasive Species Council has a good um, Instagram that they kind of post anything that's kind of new and up and coming with any uh, projects that they're looking at. Northwest Straits Commission up in the North Sound region, that's another place to keep an eye out for things that might be changing and going on up there. Uh, the department, WDFW, does not currently have a volunteer program. I do have a volunteer um, list that's on our service. And so that emails directly to me so I can get a running list of who's in volunteer work and which region. So that way, if we do have anything come up that we can kind of reach out to folks and see what's going on. Washington Sea Grants um, Crab Team is also a place to look at. They do a uh, monthly trapping and I believe it's just, you know, you set traps on one day, you return the next day to check those traps. It's only six traps and they have a dedicated location that they go to. And it's a very, um, it's a good one to get involved with. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Madison and they would like to know, is there any recreational value to green crabs to motivate shell fishers to aid in controlling the population? <clears throat> so, 
this is this is becoming a <laughs> one of those topics that come up a lot between different jurisdictions. Um, so for us in the state of Washington, there is not really any great value of green crab recreationally. They are not at the numbers that you might see on the East Coast where they might set a shrimp pot and in three hours it has over 300, you know, it's full to the brim with hundreds of crabs. Whereas we set our trap for 24 hours and we might pull out 30 crabs. These locations are also in places that are very hard to get to and they're just not safe and we don't wanna recommend anything for recreational crabbers to go into these areas. Um, but we are working with stakeholders and partners such as shellfish growers, um, that industry to communicate and collaborate on how we can uh, work together to remove as many green crabs as possible. They're also really small, so they're not a great food source. Um, I will say Dungeness are much better and you're gonna get a lot more out of that. Great, thank you. Um, are there any summer internships uh, and where should I look for those? Um, not that I know of, we don't at the department, um, but again, checking in with Washington Sea Ground, I think is going to be your best bet. And I know UW works, you know, they're based out of UW, so that's one place to keep your eye out. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Brian on Facebook, and they would like to know what size are green crabs and what depth do they run? Yeah, so let's go back. Oops, let's see if I can get back there without any too many issues. So green crab don't get much larger than four inches across the carapace. Um, and they are an intertidal shore crab. So they, they you know, you're gonna find them in high marshes, protected pocket estuaries. Um, we have not seen them in deeper waters. We're gonna do some more exploring, uh, you know, it's. It, they have the potential for seasonality where in colder um, months they might migrate to deeper waters, but we just don't have that information for our particular region yet. I know that some other places have dabbled a little bit, but for what we do and for crabs coming to the traps, the intertidal during April to October is our most active time frame. Great, thank you. Um, Amy asked, if I positively identify a green crab, what should I do? Great question. And I usually put this on my slides and I completely forgot it. So there is a email you can email with a photo and location um, to Washington Sea Grants crab team and they will respond. And I'm usually CC'd on those emails as well. If we can get um, an in time, in real time, um, confirmation of the species, then I'll have a conversation with you. Um, if not, we ask that people release them because of misidentification purposes. Um, I know it sounds counterproductive, but that's what we're doing right now during this time um, until we can get more education and outreach out to folk. There's also, sorry, there's also the Washington Invasive Species uh, reporting app. And so that's on this on your phones. You can download that and uh, you get to take a photo and you just pin your location and you attach it to which species you think it is. And then that will also get routed to our AIS email and I will be CC'd on that as well and can try to respond in real time. Great, thank you. Our next question is what is your favorite part of the job and what is the most challenging part of the job? Uh, my most favorite is being out in the field. I, I love going out with my staff. I mean, when I was first doing it, I was, not alone, because we do not try to let people go out in the field alone, because if you can see the mud, it's not great. Um, but I, you know, I always had different, uh, I would grab people from the office to go out with me. I'd collaborate with different tribal members and they go out with me. Um, I would literally grab people from the office and drag them and they were, they were <laughs> not expecting what they were got into. Um, but that's definitely my favorite part. I just, I love the camaraderie that I have with my team and um, I hope that they feel the same way. I think they do. And the most challenging is, you know, management. I think that there's, there's a lot of concerns and, you know, there's a lot of people that have opinions and it can get, it can get a little messy and it can be, 
it's almost a political game, but I think that it's important that we're all trying to do the same thing, which is reduce the numbers of green crab. And we all want to do it in a way that protects our environment and doesn't ruin it more than it's already being, um, you know, endangered by these invasive species. Thank you. What would you say is the most important soft skill? And what would you say is the most important technical skill in this role? That's a good question. Um, I think that, so technical skill, it's for a scientific technician, it's gonna be your data, uh, data entry, all of that staying organized. And it's, it's very important because that data helps us in real time determine our management actions. Soft skills, you know, if we're talking about personalities or such, it's just, you know, people that really want to get out in the field that have a great attitude and are just ready to come every day. And it's, I think that a personality that meshes well with the groups that we have is very important um, for our team. Thank you. And how do I get involved? Like if I'm, uh, if I am a student and I, I, you know, next summer I want to come work for you, what should I do? How should I connect with you? Yeah. So, um, like I said, Washington State Grant's a good source for figuring out some of the volunteer aspects, but if you want, if you're looking for full-time employment or the seasonal positions, um, it doesn't hurt to just reach out to the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I, it'll probably get directed to me somehow, but we do have an AIS email as well. Uh, I believe Leah's is going to share some of those links and contacts, but uh, for green crab in particular, I, I'm fine with people reaching out to me as well directly and expressing their interest. And um, I know that, you know, applying for work, you got to you got to get through the hiring process in order to reach to us. And there's there are a lot of people interested. And so sprucing up your resume and hitting those keywords, doing everything you can um, to get past the first round of hiring is is important and um, reaching out and getting your name out there, I think is some of the first steps you can do. What is one thing you would recommend for somebody who is interested in this, uh, in working with you and working with European green grab, crabs or aquatic invasive species? Sorry, what was that? <laughs> what is one thing you would recommend they do? Um, like okay. whether it would be networking or you know, really getting to know GIS and data. Is there one thing that you've found that's more important than, than others? I, I think it's just getting out there and doing something. It's, you know, volunteering with Sea Grant, uh, trying to sign up on a volunteer sheet that we have that shows interest, um, attending stakeholder meetings. Uh, they are provided to the public. Um, you know, just getting more involved, doing research, reaching out to professors that might be working on it. You know, there are a lot of people, um, we're in collaboration with pretty much almost any organization you can think of throughout the state of Washington. And we do see names repeatedly. And I have some in my head that I've seen, you know, and so just getting your name out there, I think is important. Awesome. Well, I think that is, Oh, one more question. How many green crab males versus females do you find and has it changed over time? <laughs> um, so I, that's, that's a hard question because it depends on where we're looking. And, you know, we do have um, sex bias in our traps depending on the season. You know, there's a lot of questions for us, but typically what we're seeing in some of these areas where there's higher densities, I, I haven't really seen anything that shows a big skew, it's usually kind of like one-to-one -one, um, from what I can tell. Awesome. Well, Chelsea, thank you so much. This has been really informative. I know I've learned a lot and I hope that the folks who've joined us have as well. Um, if you have any questions for Chelsea, I did drop the aquatic invasive species email in the chat. 
And uh, we hope that you can join us for our next Career Connections chat, which is actually on GIS and how we use GIS and LANS, and that's in February. Um, you can check our Facebook for that, or you can also check the WDFW calendar. Uh, and with that, Chelsea, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and putting this wonderful presentation together and, and sharing your career with us. This has been really lovely. Great. Thank you, everyone. This, I had a lot of fun to get out of my normal dive into data this week. So <laughs> thanks for having me here. Thanks, Chelsea. Take care. Bye.